doing is we are working our way through uh, the world's first how to draw book, which is, I think it was published in 1607. So uh, I have the original uh, book here and we've taken really high quality photos and we've just sort of as a group been working through this uh, manual that really was designed for training beginners. So in the Renaissance and before and since, uh, there have been these collections of drawings, uh, you know, the Dutch called them a cantour, and this is how uh, these kinds of drawings would be provided for the students of artists like Michelangelo and Peter Paul Rubens and Jacopo Tintoretto and all these, all these artists would have their students, typically starting as, eight, uh, as young as age six, copy these drawings. This is how they learned how to draw. So this is literally Renaissance how to draw 101. And uh, you can just copy these uh, images on your own and do your own sort of self-study and your own little investigation. Or in the case of this uh, course, we're doing it as a group and I'm sort of providing my uh, knowledge and experience having studied these, mo uh, these manuals uh, over the course of 15 years and really being sort of focused and interested in traditional drawing. So we're sort of, uh, I don't know, week five, week six, something like that. So we've already covered a lot, but because it's so foundational, because it's so beginner friendly, it's pretty, uh, it's actually pretty repetitive. Like we keep coming back to the same elements. So I'm going to, today we're gonna to be talking about uh, profiles. So the profile of the, of the head, which is uh, basically the set of curves that come down around the nose. And it is the most important set of curves for the head, uh, whether you're sculpting, whether you're modeling, or whether you're drawing, though, it's the most important collection of curves. So I'm going to, uh, real quick, I'm going to switch and to pick up the camera. And if, if it's making people dizzy, let me know. So far, that seems to be what people uh, like the best of all, is because I can move the camera around where, the, where it is. But let me know. You guys can give me feedback. Okay. Uh, Anybody is free to jump onto the stage at any time, share their work, show us what you're doing, ask questions. I want this to be very organic. There's no critique, there's no homework, there's no formal assignments. We're sort of doing this together. So if you want to draw as I talk right now, um, what I'd like you to do is do this as a warm up. And we're seeing the different stages here. And just go ahead and work on this as a warm up to what I'm talking about, because that's what I'm going to be, uh, that's what I'm going to be discussing right now. So let me just switch here. I'll turn off the camera and then turn it back on. So everyone doesn't get dizzy. Okay. So we've already covered um, the individual features. So we drew the eye from the side, from the front, and then from top down, uh, upshot, different angles. We did that with the nose and the mouth and the chin. We did it with the ear. Uh, now we're looking at sort of the, the face as a whole. Um, and last, last week we talked about how the head is built on an egg and that's the traditional construction. You can see that here. So this is the method that the old masters used uh, typically to draw heads, whether they're from imagination or whether the heads are from uh, uh, life or from another model. They would use this simple ovoid form. They would wrap ellipses around it, and then they would place those features that we've been studying individually into those drawings. So we've been talking about that. So is that still true with the head from the side view? Uh, absolutely, it absolutely is. That being said, um, the individual features and looking at every set of curves from the individual features, those do need to chain together properly. So in other words, this is built on an egg, right? And we talked about the ellipses, which have a certain proportional relationship, you know, like typically the eye line is halfway from the apex of the head to the bottom of the chin in an adult. Uh, the, the eyebrow, brow line is above that. From the brow to the base of the chin, halfway is the base of the nose. From the base of the nose to the bottom of the chin, halfway is the, uh, the lower lip, the, where the vermilion, the red part or the uh, darker part of the lip joins the rest of the lip. Um, the ear is going to be around the same size as the nose. So if you put lines back here from the nose to the ear, it tends to be similar. The lobes can vary a bit more. 
So there are these proportions. This class isn't about proportions, but there is a, a configuration that sort of determines where the ellipses should go on that X. You see these dotted lines here. And, and that's not something we're covering in this class, but that is obviously important. We're, we're focused more on the basic drawing approach. And so for us right now, what I want to talk about is, and just as a recap for people, um, there is sort of a traditional way to do uh, line work. And let me do it over here for you. So for example, I'm starting with a number one here. And so I've got, I don't go more than one C curve. So I'll have a C curve here, then it straightens out. Then there's another C curve that sort of drops down. And then there's an area of rest, which is in other words, it's a concavity. It's a concavity. And then it continues out into a sort of a shallow hill of a bump in this case. And then it's going to straighten out. And then we've got a little area of rest or a concavity. And then the tip of the nose is going to drop. And then it's going to be picked up again. And then it comes back and so on and so on. And so that's the traditional line work. So in other words, we have a start point for every stroke, right? So we have a start point and an end point of every stroke. And I'm just going to draw a straight line here for illustration purposes. And then we have an apex. So if it's a, we can think of it as a mountain or a valley, convex or concave, but somewhere there needs to be a apex, the point where if you drew a, a straight line between the start point and end point of the curve, this is the point that is most orthogonal or most uh, right angled out in space. It's the apex, right? And so just like when we're drawing an ellipse or a circle or a box construction and we've got the, uh, we've got the lines there, we just need to run through those curves. And then, so this, 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 that has the, uh, this is a regular, a regular curve because it's got the apex sort of halfway between the start and end point, but it doesn't have to be. It can be an irregular curve, right? So from here to here, let's put a straight line just to illustrate. The apex could be way over here. And so in this case, the curve's got a different look, right? But once we've got, once we've got our curve, then we can chain it together with the next curve. So if this is like a hill, we might have a valley after that, like this, and then maybe it straightens out. And then maybe it, then there's another C curve that curves the other way. And we just chain together these curves. So we don't draw, so just like in calligraphy, we don't draw an O like this. We would do one stroke and another stroke. We don't draw an S like that with one stroke we would draw one stroke and another stroke. And the way that we overlap the strokes, which takes practice, that's how we get the clean line work. It's not that it's against the rules to draw an S curve and the old masters would do that, especially when sketching. Uh, and you can do this when you have a lot of confidence, but breaking the curves that seem super complex into the, these strokes, that's absolutely key to being able to uh, draw in this traditional way when we're talking about line work. So that's what's going on here. Uh, we're starting to think about how this profile, uh, so we didn't study the forehead, for example, we did study the curves of the nose and the curves of the mouth. So these are like a rehashing, these are familiar for you, but now we're chaining them all together to create a full head. So let me bring up a uh, sec. Also, if anyone has any questions on, on that recap, you can ask me right now. I think I'm happy to talk about that before I move on to the next part. Uh, currently, we do not have any questions. Okay, great. I'm just going to pull up one of the uh, profile profile images here. Are you switching cameras, okay. Joshua? Okay, yeah. I don't want to make it. I don't want to make everybody dizzy, so I've had to reach over. I'm just turning it on. Oh, okay. okay. So here we see uh, three heads, and it's the entire head with hair, with facial hair, with a little bit of drapery, and with some very basic rendering. Uh, if you if you finish those first steps that uh, we were just talking about, it might be a good idea to move on to these now. And so the point here is that the construction doesn't change depending on the character of the person. It's still an egg. There's still the ellipses. There's still the profile. Um, the actual construction is extremely similar. And then the differences just come into um, what these curves are doing. So how much does it bulge here? How much does it drop? What, how high is this tip? How does it curve around? 
Um, same thing with the hair. Where is that, you know, so we've got sort of uh, these different tufts of hair. Where are they located? How deep are they? How thick are they? And so we can get different faces, right? We can get different designs of faces. This nose drops more, for example, although it's a pretty similar. This The jaw here is a little more uh, defined. It's got more of a, a C curve here, uh, rest area, a more generous C curve, a more generous one, whereas this is a bit more simple. Uh, this is a little more of a classical sort of a younger full figured fattier you know more generous form this is more of a, a chiseled out kind of a form here we've got a very full figure right so we're actually losing this the strong sense of the angle of the jaw of the mandible because fat is sort of wrapping around just like imagine wrapping like fiberglass insulation around an ac duct or something it's being vitiated the curves are being vitiated here um but essentially we're just no matter what character, what head we draw in the traditional way, we're just styling up. We're just styling up the same techniques. And so that that's really what this plate is about. And so this is a great exercise for you to go ahead and draw these curves. Uh, I would start with the profile and all of these. And I wouldn't get into the hatching uh, just now if you're just practicing, just focus on these primary design lines that really define the form. When I say primary design line, I'm talking about the curves in the drawing that tell you where the major surfaces are changing. So, for example, the profile is definitely doing that. Uh, some of these lines of the eye are definitely doing that. And then the hatching or the tonal work is supporting and describing the surface between these primary design lines. That's that's how the traditional drawing works. Um, and that's basically how drawing has worked for you know, uh, at least 40,000 years, probably as, as long as, uh, much, much older than that, much longer than that, 40,000 years ago, 43,000 years ago, at least. So we've got our outlines, our primary design lines, right? And then we've got additional lines that are just there to round this form away, it's to push this form back. The hatching is supporting the primary design lines and the construction is the same. So that's what I want you guys to be thinking about uh, this week. I want you to be thinking about profiles. And I'm just going to right now jump to one more uh, image to talk about, and then we can let me see here. And then we, we can. Uh... Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, Marquis is asking for uh, these more fully realized heads. Should we do graphite under drawings? You. It's up to you. You can. Um, the reason I'm not encouraging people to do that in this class is just because I think it's a good idea to get experience doing the line work, doing it directly. Because if you, with the underdrawing makes it a lot easier. And the underdrawing is traditional. There's nothing not traditional about this. But because this is sort of like a calligraphy kind of an exercise, it's like here's how we do the letter A. It's more like do it and do it and do it and do it again. Think of like when you were first learning how to write as a child, right? They give you the lines and it's like the letter B, the letter B, the letter B. I'm treating it more like that because that's the way that it would have been taught to the to the young students, but it's up to you. So I would I would really try practicing doing this directly as an exercise, as additional practice. I mean, I know you're working on incredibly fancy paper with this cool thing, so maybe you're an exception to this, but it's building confidence and not worrying about it being perfect, but trying to do it several times and get closer. I think that's really uh, the name of the game at this stage. So do you have, do you have another question or did that answer your question, Marquise? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. I believe that it's answers. Cool. Yeah, Go he says it. thank Go you. Yep. We have another okay. question from Mujita, yeah. if that's okay. Sure. In terms yeah, yeah. of sequence, how would you tackle this? Draw the egg head, focus on nose, lips, chin, this eyes, ear, hair. Yeah, so um, the egg is, always underpinning the entire design but because the profile gives you so much of that structure it's the one angle where you can probably get away with like the least amount of eggness but there are some things that it that using an egg in a profile view will give you that is important not to lose uh, let me show you so what an egg is going to give you in a profile view because what i'm saying here is that if this is a series of curves that we're essentially uh, memorizing and learning how to modify, it's it's sort of a two-dimensional problem as far as this is concerned. But when you do the egg, so if you put the lower part of the egg here, and then and also you, everybody look at uh, look at Elisa's eggs. They're basically perfect in terms of like how to do this in a really clean way. Maybe if somebody has it or if Elisa's here, you can share it in the chat. 
but check out uh, Alicia's eggs. So anyway, so the small part of the egg would be here. The, the, the large part end of the egg would be here. So it's typically, I like to tip the egg back rather than have the egg vertical, because if you tip it back, you get this cranium mass. If you have the egg vertical, you have to add a cranial mass. So I tip the egg, egg back, but by getting the egg and then by doing not just uh, horizontal lines, but trying to think of them more as ellipses that are pretty flattened out. But if you think of them as ellipses, what that gives you is that it reminds you that this is a curved surface. This is not flat, which is one of the biggest problems that artists do. Uh, do. They, make the, they make it flat. So in other words, um, look, this is clearly being lit as an egg. The light's coming from the front, a little bit above. And just like a sphere, if you were to render a sphere from imagination, you would have the uh, core shadow, right, that would move. And what shape would that core shadow make if you're uh, lighting the sphere? Well, it, of course, it would be an ellipse, right? So th there is still this sort of elliptical shape, except for this isn't a sphere, this is a head. And so that's, that core shadow is getting broken up. But thinking of it as an egg will help re remind you of where the actual shade is going to go instead of just putting lines everywhere. So that's one important thing. It also helps you do things like this, round, because this is the wide point of the head, uh, of, the, of the face, uh, right here. Sometimes this point back here often is a little bit wider, but the widest point of the face is right here, right? He's got it a little further forward than I would put it. I think I'd put it a little bit into the hatching here, but the side of the, you can feel this on your own head. Feel your cheekbones from the front of your face. So this, uh, to show you. So feel your cheekbones here, right? So this is the orbit of your eye. This is bone, 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 right? And then the actual lowest part of the cheekbone, you have to really poke your finger in here. It's around the level of your nose down here. You have to really poke and find that corner because there's fat on it. Uh, there's uh, maxillary fat and there's soup and roof fat and a bunch of, it's, there's basically a bunch of soft tissues here, right? And there's also muscles. There's zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor and other muscles. But if you feel the bottom part of your uh, cheekbone here, you can feel your cheekbone all the way back towards, and this is a mistake that a lot of people make. Uh, a lot of the people who do the Riley method I've seen make this mistake, but just a lot of people make this mistake, is they think the cheekbone goes up here. It does not. The cheekbone goes down here to your, towards your ear hole. So this is the external auditory meatus. We can feel the cheekbone and it gets widest right here, way back here towards the ear. And then what it does is it dives into the ear hole. So that's very easy to forget and get wrong and make your ear look wrong and make the whole side of your head look wrong. So another advantage to using the egg from a profile view is that you're able to remember that this is roundness. So because the eyes and the nose and everything are on this side of the egg, what that really means is that they're back in space, they're in the picture plane. And then the stuff that is coming around the egg here is closer to us. So that's, that's a, a really useful thing because it, it can be very hard with profiles to make them feel three-dimensional because most of what we are thinking about is, is this 2D set of curves. So yeah, so in terms of the process, you would draw an egg lightly, right? Because the egg is actually construction or, uh, in, or in another material, it's up to you, but you would lightly or with dots, I like to use dots. So I might do something like this, I'll show you. I might do something like this. Just do a uh, real, I don't know if you can even see that on the camera. Do really light dots and then, because they're easy to see for you, but they're pretty minimal amount of uh, information. And then you can put lines on them. So you could do a series of dots. But basically, yeah, you have this egg construction. You probably also want to lightly mark the proportions. So uh, halfway from the top to the bottom is going to be where the ears are. Or in the case of this class, because we're not going into proportions, you can kind of just visually do it. But you can mark basically where the mouth and where the nose and where the eyes and where the brow are going to go. Make a little mark where the base of the ear and the top of the ear are going to go. Make a mark for maybe where the neck is going to go. And remember that comes back. And then I would just sort of, this is like sort of a direct drawing class. So I would work my way down the profile. So I would do, I would do something like this. Okay, so this is a C curve. And then there's actually an overlap. Sorry, let me get this right. Overlap, and then this, this is another C curve. And then this comes in more. And then there's actually another overlap here. And this is an area of rest, but it's also a bit longer. And then it moves out. And then there's the, the bump 
where this is where the uh, the nasal bone joins with the uh, the lateral uh, cartilages, and then it drops, and then just work my way down the profile, work my way down the profile, and you can just get right into the beard. You don't have to draw the chin first to do that, and then sort of find my way from the profile back, and I sometimes use the eyebrow to do that. So in other words, I'll I'll do something like to be consumed. I'll use the uh, almost like I'm doing a gesture drawing. But I'll use the curves of the eyebrow to get back to the back corner of the eye, and then come just like we did for our very first drawings, and then come forward. So I'll I'll go down. I'll come, I'll use the eyebrow to get across and come back to this point here, which even sculpture at least, which is where the old masters are copying all of this. This is actually the most important landmark on the head in, uh, in sculpture, I believe, other than uh, this is what we teach sometimes. But getting back to here is really important because then this is like the junction point of all the different plane changes here, here, here. The eyebrow leads to it. It's also how we can hook in and get into the eye. So that's the way I would go. I would go down the profile, right? I would carry the eyebrow back to here, and then I would wrap under and then define uh, the upper lid, then the top of the lid, and just go through the same process we did for the first, for the very first one, for the very first uh, exercises we did in this class. So the Fialetti plates, the first Fialetti plates. And then once you start, once you're getting the face in place, I think it's a good idea not to wait too long to get the, the cheekbone, the wide point of the head in place. But at that point, you're just, it, it's up to you really, I think. It, it, this is all up to you. There's no specific order you have to go in. But once you've got this uh, in place, then I think you can start blocking in the beard and the other pieces. It can also be a good habit to do the neck before you uh, take this any further because making a mistake in the neck is easier if at the end of the drawing you're kind of tired and then you do the neck and you're not being as careful. So it can also make sense to do the neck or even do some of the drapery early. But basically what I would recommend for this is do the profile, place the eye, uh, place the inside of the mouth, place the ear, come up the cranium, get the back of the neck, get the outlines for the neck and maybe stop it there then start resolving some of this information. And like I said, you can move in this way and then come across. So because we practice, I mean, we practice this eye so many times, right? Some of you can do it from imagination by now, but we practice this and then we practiced uh, this and then we practiced, I did that as one curve. I should have done it as two, sorry. That should have been one, two instead of one. Uh, we do another one here or if we're trying to create a dark, we do a few. Then we do the iris coming back and it comes about as low as down here. The iris coming back and then we can build that iris out of multiple strokes and we can build the pupil out of multiple strokes. And then we can come over from this side, wrap around, right? You know this pattern, you've done it so many times. Well, that, use, your, use that pattern when you get to the eye. That's really the, the key. It's like you've studied the eye, you've studied the nose, you've studied these other patterns, then you're learning how to construct the eggs and the lines. And then you're, when you get here, you should be like home free. You should be like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. So you study the local, you study the global, you study the local in relation to the global, and then you uh, just keep practicing and it keeps reinforcing and reinforcing itself. So uh, is that good? Uh, is there another question for that or can I move on to the next part here? Wiggly. We don't have. Uh, we don't have any other questions pertaining this. Okay. Uh, somebody's asking if you're using silver point. I believe it is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, yeah. this is, uh, uh, yeah. I think it's a sterling silver. This is based on a. This is based on an antique, uh, antique design. And I also use uh, silver silver point wire. So this is just silver wire, and this is in a uh, like an architect's. Uh, ro uh, rotaring style uh, mechanical pencil. This is actually Pacific Arc, but you can, you can also get a uh, rotaring or any mechanical pencil. So you just stick the you stick the silver into this. But the key is though that that won't draw on regular paper uh, well. You you actually need to have specially prepared uh, silver point paper, or in this case, I'm using uh, stone paper. So this is karst, and then this is etched. But the stone paper I'm really into right now. And I love I love drawing like this. So um, Okay. If there's anything else that comes up, have, just let me know. Yes, yeah. it just came up. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> uh, can you show 
Gemma, Gemma is asking, can you show us the underlying egg? Often it's difficult to create a correct proportion between all features. Yeah, so I don't want to get into proportion for this class because okay. the only reason why is we just don't have time because my proportions of the heads go really in depth and they would take, you know, it would be a whole class. But what I recommend for you is to go to Renaissance because look, Glenn Bilku uses the, he, he uses a very Renaissance approach. That's why we call it Renaissance head drawing. Uh, but Glenn uses Leonardo's uh, proportions of the head, which Leonardo based on Vitruvius, which is the eight head figure that was summarized by the Roman architect Vitruvius. The model for Vitruvian's description is the eight head proportion system of Lysippos. And Lysippos' proportions are just a modification of the original canon of proportion by Polycleitus. There's so much to it. but. What I would do is I would look at Glenn Vilpu's Renaissance head drawing lectures, the first week lectures, because he gives an excellent breakdown of where those ellipses go. Although he's not teaching, it's not completely traditional. It's Glenn's approach. It's quite tra traditional, but it's also, it's not the same as Fialetti or Michelangelo or something, but he does use the proportions that are uh, Leonardo-esque and they're, they're quite good. Uh, I can give you a very quick summary of those if you, if you want, but um, I just know that we can't really cover it all, but uh, Okay, so look, uh, this line represents the eyes, right? That line, this ellipse, this should be halfway between the bottom of the chin and the top of the head. The top of the head is not here. That's a beginner mistake. Top of the head is here. So in other words, I can't do this in 2D. It's 3D thinking. So what do I mean by 3D thinking? What I mean is that you actually need to figure out where, because we're using a vertical line, right? We're using a profile idea right? It's not tipped when we learn the, the proportions, right? But this is tipped. So basically what it ends up looking like is, maybe I can do that up here. Uh, it's a little awkward, but basically what it ends up looking like. Sorry, guys, I'm like stretched over here. It's an awkward... So if we're trying to place the uh, ellipse for the eyes, and let's say, and let's say we're just observing this, that that's where the ellipse for the eyes are. It's not from the top to the bottom halfway. This is a huge mistake, right? It's not that. Why isn't it this? Why isn't the eye line right here? Did we freeze? Did we drop? I uh, well, just give us a second. It seems like a bad connection. Are you guys doing okay though? I see some of you are saying that you guys are getting a bit dizzy. Yeah, yeah. It it seems like we have a connection issue over on Joshua's side. Uh, just give us like a minute. It, like Lisa uh, demonstrated. That's what we're going to be doing in Italy uh, on the first lecture day. So this is literally like an actual chicken egg with actual horizontal and vertical lines drawn on it. That's literally how we're thinking of it. It's not something more advanced than that. Why is it so simple? Because this is how we can post something from imagination. So it can't be too complex because then we can't do it from imagination. So once we have the egg and then we have the ellipses in the right place, then we can actually start putting the line work in for our eyes that we've in our nose and our mouth. Or as we're gonna see in a moment, we can do the profile and think of that as a whole unit as well. That's the traditional process. Let me know if that makes sense. But anyway, um, the proportions are uh, halfway between the bottom and the top uh, of the head is the eyes. The brow is slightly above that. It depends on the character. So if you have a, like a very strong caveman brow or a very, droopy kind of a brow or a very soft brow. These are going to be in different locations, but you place the brow there. Halfway between the brow and the base of the, uh, the bottom of the head is the base of the nose. Halfway between the base of the nose to the bottom is actually the uh, lower lip here, not the opening of the mouth. Uh, the ear aligns with the nose and with the brow. So the nose and the brow, we just wrap those back. If you take, uh, if you take from the bottom of the chin to the base of the nose, is that's one unit. Well, then another unit up 
uh, takes you to the brow and another unit up takes you to the uh, peak of the hairline. And if there's no hair there, it's really the curve of the frontal bone and how it starts to move backwards. Those are the basics of head proportion. You can get way more into it, but that's all you really need to get like a pretty good, uh, oh yeah, in the, in the angle of the jaw, which is this corner right here, that typically is gonna line up with the corner of the mouth as well if that makes sense so those are sort of the basics and, and those aren't the same exact proportions used by everybody there's variations on them over time but the important thing is that you have a proportion system of some kind and that you're thinking of that when you're placing the ellipses on your egg and then we can move into uh putting the features on so that, that that's the traditional method let me know if that makes sense so quickly now what i want to demonstrate is here we're seeing a variety of poses again so these are different faces this is a very highly classicized head which means, you know, uh, the way that the, the Renaissance artists interpreted that is they really focus on this sort of a brow and how it transitions into this nose, it's considered a Roman nose. From the tip of the nose back, the profile uh, retreats, it goes backwards. Uh, the upper, uh, upper lip is always further forward in, in a traditional context, although if you have an underbite, obviously, that can change. There's all different kinds of lips, but typically the upper lip is forward, lower lip is back. And you've got a generous round chin and a generous jawline, very shapely ear with clear changes. That's going to give you more of a Renaissance version of a classical look. But this is not this uh, page is not actually about variation like the other one is. This plate is actually about how you can take the profile, which we can think of in terms of um, a series of lines here, right? So this is a C curve. This is a straight. This is a, another C curve, but the other way. It's a little area of rest. This is pretty straight, but or you could treat this as a very shallow C curve. This it, it, uh, there's a uh, inflection, so it turns the other way. Another stroke here, another stroke here, another stroke here. It's really important not to cut this off, right? Don't make this sharp. If this looks like some kind of right angle, you made a big mistake. It's got to be, it's got to be curved. It's got to be concave, and the way it wraps out all the way down the profile, right? Um, I don't think that uh, Fialetti shows this. Oh yeah, he actually does, I think somewhere, but there's in the in medieval times and the Renaissance and maybe even earlier, they would think sometimes of a triangle. So they would use this uh, idea of a triangle and then they would just have a, an area here that represents the ear. And uh, a contemporary version of this would be Steve Houston's uh, sail from a sailboat shape that he talks about. That's a modification of this, uh, this old pattern. But this is actually useful because you can use the ear as a pivot point, right? Because I don't wanna get into the anatomy, but this is the external auditory meatus. And then the, uh, the uh, opening of the skull that joins the spine, uh, I don't wanna get into the anatomy too much of it, but that's where the major pivoting happens. So when you nod your head or shake your head, that's not happening throughout the neck, as you might think. Those actions are actually happening right here. So this is actually where the head is pivoting from if it tilts and tips back. So it's actually useful and it's close enough to use the ear as this pivot point, right? And then what you can do is you can swing. So I can swing all these points on a pivot, but you can swing, sorry, tell me if you guys can't see this. So you can swing the head back using this triangle from that ear and you can tip the head up. That's what's being shown here. So beyond the egg, you can also think of this triangular construction, or you can just use the egg, but just remember that it pivots from around the ear. A little bit in front in, in anatomical reality, but it pivots there. So basically you're taking this profile, which we can think of as uh, on, a, on a straight line or on a curved line, but this entire profile is on here, right? So that's all these curves here, and we can use a pivot and we can then rotate the head this way or this way. So like nodding motion, right? And that's just gonna take this whole pattern. What's it gonna do? It's just gonna rotate the pattern from a profile view, right? But knowing where from where it rotates is important. This is gonna change the relationship of the neck though, obviously, because now look, look at how, this would be the hyoid bone. This is the larynx. But look at how uh, this is becoming more stretched out versus this, look how shallow this is. So it does affect the uh, bottom of the, jaw this is the submandibular area and it does affect the neck but all it really is is taking three points here and then rotating them on the ear to to look up um it still is an egg but that can be useful if we're thinking about 
the, the contours here. Okay, so what else can we do? That's something we can do with a profile, with the profile set of curves. We can do that. What else can we do with it? Well, we can uh, slightly turn it. And comic book artists will tell you this. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of artists who do manga and comics and illustration, people who do lots of character heads from different angles, they'll tell you the same thing, that if you have like a slight three-quarter or a slight vanishing three-quarter, that's what this is called. So a three-quarter is, uh, this is not really a full three-quarter. I know the fractions don't make sense. This is just how artists talk about it. So a three-quarter would be three-quarter, right? But in reality, anything that's not a profile or front view is considered a three-quarter or a back view. So this is a vanishing three-quarter. This is a, a frontal three-quarter, but it's very slight. So it's close to a profile view. We haven't rotated it that much. But if it's close to a profile view, usually the best way to handle it is you're still doing the, you're still thinking of the profile of the head, but you're just making it a bit more shallow because it's turned a little bit. And then you're sort of adding uh, the far side eye, the mouth wrapping behind, the underside of the chin on the other side. And similarly to here, where with the vanishing profile, look at this, uh, this, this is the cheekbone, right? And this is the orbit. Well, in a, in a side view, that stuff would not be blocking the eye because it's back here, right? But if we do a vanishing profile, so let me show you uh, in life, right? So if I can, so, so side view versus vanishing profile, right? This is the cheekbone here. I don't know if you guys can tell, but from a side view, the cheekbone is, from a profile, it's not blocking my eye or the base of my nose necessarily. But if we do a vanishing profile, so we start to go to a rear view, start to go to a rear view, this now starts to block this stuff. And that is what is happening here, right? So these forms are starting to obscure. So we're still thinking of a profile here. We're just making it more shallow and we're turning it this way. And we're still thinking of a profile here. It's just the profile is hiding behind the eye here. It's still back there. It's still back there, even though it's hiding the front of the lip, the center of the lip down here. So once you have a profile and you get comfortable with this view, you can use that as a starting point to slightly turn it one way or slightly turn it to the other way. So you can use this to tilt it this way, and you can use this to slightly make different views. And that gives you a very, very big range of poses just using that technique or that technology that we're talking about. Are there any questions on that? And also, that's all the lecture I wanted to get through on this one, so we, I can demo or we can, uh, I can answer questions, or you guys can just share what you're working on right now. Uh, we do not have any questions so far. Does anybody want to share their work and get some feedback? Do, do you want to come up stage? Sure. Okay. Okay, cool. I haven't yelled at do enough today. <laughs> and then we have Marquise. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, let me share my camera. Is that sure. is that reversed or is it like normal? That looks normal. Let me let me zoom in. Okay. All right, just checking. Can you uh, for me? Yes, yeah, so uh do you want me to give feedback on this or do you want to draw a little bit? I can watch and give you feedback or both. Um either or I can I can, I can continue this this one uh yep. plate here. I yeah. think you have the right number of changes in the line. Right, so you have the right number of changes, but the apexes and the start and end points of every stroke, they're kind of inaccurate a little bit. So what's happening is it's sort of wobbling. It's sort of like, ding, dong, bang, bang, bang. it's kind of getting uh, bent and quirky. So keep doing what you're doing, but more accurate. Just slow it down a little bit. So try doing one of the profiles you already did, do it again. But this time I want you to think, where's the start point? Where's the end point? How high or low? How far apart are they? and where's the apex of every stroke as you go. Just be more, keep looking back and forth between your reference and your work and do it more accurately and more slowly, but essentially do the same thing. Okay, no I'll pressure. try doing uh, number nine again here. Let me see. Number, hold on, let me pull it up too so I can see. Okay, okay, go ahead. Oh, no, you're doing number. Okay, you're doing number nine of the. Okay. Yeah, of the uh, of the profile yeah. ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. Keep going. Okay. 
Okay, so I think that uh, that that convexity you you made the apex too far back, too far to the right. So you're you're it's exaggerating. Too far this way. It. Yeah, you're exaggerating it unintentionally. Try to get like get that exact. Keep going, but try to really get the get the right amount of curve. That's really important because, and I know coming from animation and stuff, often it's like push it, push it, push it, but you can't always push it. Sorry, salt and pepper. You can't always push it. Sometimes you have to show some. You gotta be accurate. Here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So one thing I, I see is it's a little bit of a petting, right? So it's a little bit of a your pen, your tip floats, and then you kind of think about it, and then you kind of pet it. Instead, it should be more of like a. I'm going to start it here and I'm going to end it there. And you can put little points there for the start and end of the stroke, tiny, tiny little dots. You can try that. But then when it comes okay. time to perform it, get the hand moving, uh, get it moving with follow through so before you touch down. And then you just have to, you just have to commit to it. Not fast, but commit it. Try not to okay. sneak up on the way you're just doing it. Does that make sense? Because when I say co like committed, yeah. people probably think of like dynamic sketching where it's like you shoot it out. I'm not saying that. It's 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 a commitment, but it's also controlled and slow. But what that means is you get the hand moving, get the hand moving. Think about the start, think about the end, think about the apex, and then we just do the damn thing. So it's more like think, think, mark, think, think, mark, instead of think, pet, pet, pet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that that curve is quite long. The one you're about to do, right? So you definitely want to think about the start and end point, and then don't put the little S curve tail at the end of it, right? That's another stroke. So that's two strokes to get you down to the tip of the nose. Okay, so one, then two, okay. Yeah, well, th and also think about the length. Dude. Think about the length, because the length of all the curves you've drawn so far is about the same length if we drop it to the tip of the nose. So the next curves that you should be doing, the next two strokes should be as long as what you already have on the page. So take a moment to think about proportion as you're working too. How long is okay. it? How far, how far out to the left is it going to go too? Yeah, try making a dot for the start, the end, and then the stroke, because I think you're gonna overdo it. I can already tell. And then like here. It's be further down than that. Now. So like down here. Yeah, at least maybe a little further even for the end point. Unless you're, yeah, so you're doing that stroke there. Okay, so, so start point, end point, put a, put a point for the apex too, and then just run a line through those points with confidence and with a little bit of rehearsal. Oh, yeah, yeah try to get, go, go into the tipping, but keep, yeah, so that's probably kinking out too much. So probably the apex is too far to the left, and the end point of that stroke wasn't far enough to the left. So it's, it needs to be more like a ramp. You made it more vertical, and then so this bump, but you left a bump out here, and so uh, you left the bump out here, and it's more vertical, which makes the bump look too big. If you had just tilted the end point, and this, so this is the start point, this is the end point of the curve, right? And then here's the bump. Yeah. You had it like yeah. this, but you left the bump here, so that's how you're distorting it. So it's an accuracy problem. Uh, start point, end point, apex. Start point, end point, apex, and then a little more follow through with the lines. That's what you need. Gotcha. To it's accuracy. That's it's not accuracy with the grid but it is accuracy, just seeing what's longer, how far out. That's just a general kind of accuracy that you wanna work on. Okay, let's go into the tip. Okay, I have that too. Yeah, so the tip is going to be one, two, three, three strokes, and then a fourth for the, uh, the filter. So it's it's one stroke. So it looks like it's one stroke for the uh, greater alar cartilages and the lateral cartilages, which are right coming together right here. That's one stroke, and then it's another stroke coming down the greater alar cartilages, and then it's another stroke for the columella, and then another hook into the filtrum. So one, two, three, four. Minimum. That's how many strokes. You, you can't do the tip with a with one C curve. It'll look unless you want to look like Archie comic or something. You know. It could be the style of the work. I hope I'm not running out of ink. This would be embarrassing. I, mean, I think you already got some feedback that you can work on, even if it does. I think it's all right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, you came out, the, came out 
distance here as you just did here. So you, you went, this stroke for you was around the same as this, but this should be longer. So accuracy, keep this, working on that. This was, too, this was too short right here. Yeah, just, uh, just, so, ju just on the way we're talking about it right now, just that's your world right now. Just get those more accurate and, and just keep doing that. You know, you, you're, I know okay. you can drill something. This is what you should be drilling in. Get them more accurate, get it more confident, get them more fluid, chain together those strokes, work on that. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, nice work. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, is there somebody else that wanted to add anything? Yeah, Marquise is waiting. There we go. Okay. Yep. Hey, Joshua. Hi. Sorry, no, um, when I was going through this, yeah, I wasn't. I was so focused on like the line, the C curves that I wasn't measuring or compare being comparative. So I can yeah. see big mistakes, especially around like number, I believe it's like number seven. And I try to correct that on the last well, one. That's the, that's the proper order. First, we learn how to make the curves and connect them. And then we get them more accurate. That's, I think that's the, that's okay. the best way. Yeah, do you wanna show us? Yeah, I have my camera on. Okay. Or I can take a picture, but that's probably easier. No, turn, turn your camera. It's good to see you move. Oh, are you able to see it now? Yeah, mastering the proportions of the head, you guys, is not required. For this class at this moment you can just do it based on the lines this line's longer this comes down this is further just use general accuracy kinds of thinking oh, are you sharing your screen Mark, please yes i am i don't know if you can see yes, it yes. oh the unstable thing hold on i just have to override it that's dumb that make you do that turn on their video okay Yeah, you know, it's funny, you know the way you're correcting that nose uh, on the one bottom row, second to most right, you see how you're correcting the tip of the nose? Yes. You made, you made the line thicker because you're moving it, right? It's like a pentamenti, right? Yeah. That's exactly how the old masters would do it. I've seen that a million times in, in old master drawings. So they often will do that. They'll just correct it and correct it because they're just trying to get the right shape. It's not. They're not doing it at a CTN on a projector or something. It doesn't, they, don't have to, they don't have to pretend that every mistake was intentional in that context because they're trying to find the shape they want. So they'll just move it. So that, that's, I don't know if that's an imitation, but that's a, good, that's a good way to do it, the way you handle it. That's exactly how I've seen many old master drawings do it. Oh, okay. It's a form of pentamentum. So yeah, is you want to draw pentamentum is when they're like drawing multiple limbs and stuff. Pentamenti is where you just redraw the line instead of erasing it or committing to it and pretending like it was the right place the whole time, just confidently sort of redrawing it. That's pen, that's pentamenti. Pentamenti. Mm. It means pentamenti. Okay. Like, whoops. Like, yeah. Okay. Then yeah, I'll, I'll do a new one then. Oh, that's a here. You know um, yeah. Yeah, and drawing a little bigger would help with the camera, and it also would be good practice if you want to slightly larger. To do them a lot larger? Not a lot larger, but doing a, do a bit bigger so we can see the lines a little easier, and it's also a good exercise because you don't want to only be able to draw the head one size. So you want to always vary the scale of the okay. work. What, so what's okay, then I'll redo number 10. number 10 from the same page. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, start um, at the top. Okay, so already uh, it's too, you're moving too far in horizontal space. I can tell. Okay. You know what I mean? So you're, you're kind of doing that where it's really this, do you see? So what I want everybody to do, because I'm seeing a, a common thread here, actually put a tiny little dot for your start point and a tiny little dot for your end point of your stroke and make sure they have the right relationship from left to right, then put a little apex and then draw the curve. So can you, can you continue it like that? But I want you to hide those points. I don't wanna see those points at the end of the line. That'll help you get these lines more accurate. Does that make sense? Each stroke, start and apex, little points, and then you run your line through them. Let's do that. So the, 
they sound like the beginnings here. And well, then no, the, the beginning, end, the beginning is like, where your last. The beginning is where your last line left off, because we're going down the phase. We're going from top to bottom. See, see okay. how you show. And then, see, so I went too far out with this one. Yeah, what I'm saying is use points. Here, let me show you what I mean. Let me show you real quick. You can keep your camera on. Oh. Joshua, are you talking because we we cannot hear you? I think he's just demonstrating. Yeah, I'm not sure that's what that's why I'm asking. Oh, yeah, I, I think he is talking. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> I think he can't. I think he can't hear us either. He can't. No, he's definitely talking. <laughs> oh no! Uh, one second. <laughs> He can't hear us and we can't hear him. Oh, no. He's just screaming oh. into the silence. One second. No. Oh, okay. He's rejoining. One second, guys. Technical issues. <laughs> Michael, an artist respects the silence. <laughs> Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Awesome. Hey, now. Did you? How much of that did you hear with the points? None. Nothing. Okay. So, Mark, what I'm saying is that this is what the students are doing. They're just they're they're using the right number of curves, but they're distorting it. Accurate. So, what will help accuracy is to use three points for every curve. That's what I was showing here. So, in other words. First curve starts here, ends here, here's the apex, here's the stroke. Next stroke starts here, uh, it goes here, ends here, and here's the stroke. The next one starts here, here's the apex, here's the thing, and here's the stroke. Use three points for every stroke, and as you're using those three points, make sure they're in the right place. They're accurate, mm. right? So the first point's here for the first stroke. This isn't one C curve. This isn't one C curve, right? Why isn't it one C curve? Because it's irregular. It has like little changes here. So this could be one C curve. So start point, end points over here. Apex is pretty shallow, stroke. The end point's now the new start point. Start point, I need to go down to here. End point, mm -hmm. apex, stroke. Then there's this concavity, it's an area of rest. Start point is the last point I ended on. 
the apex is going to be to the right because it's con concave, and then the endpoint is going to be somewhere here. So then make the stroke. So make three points for every stroke. That'll help you. It's like playing. It's like playing arpeggios or scales, like you were saying. That'll help you get it right. It's breaking down the movement into its parts. Because what's happening is, you, people are you're just freestyling the strokes too much. It needs to be more methodical. Bop, bop, mm -hmm. Next one. Bop, 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 next one. Bop, bop. And then with practice, it'll look fluid. So let, try doing that. Okay. So it feels like I need to work slower and more intentional. Yeah, but I, yeah, but do it right now. This is a general cool. advice. This is specific. Do it for this profile. Okay. So you did your first stroke already, or you can start a new one. As a I'm going to do another one. Okay. The camera. So then. Does that make sense, though? Breaking every stroke down into those three points. Absolutely. I think I was right. And then connecting. Yeah. It's like if you guys have ever drawn a circle in a square, you take a square, you draw the X, you find the midpoint, and then you create these touch points, right? My lips PDF covers this touch point at the top, touch point in the middle of the side, and then you draw a circle where you're trying to connect them. So your curved line is trying to hit all the points. Use that same approach for each of these strokes, which are usually C curves. Usually C curves are straights. There's, there's really nothing else I can be. And then same here. Yeah. I'm at, I'm, you, don't need to, you don't need to draw the new start point because the end point is the start point of the next three, right? So you can just use that point. And then you need to find what's the next apex. So, okay, so you're drawing number 10, right? So it's, it's, it's not quite a straight line, but it's a very shallow C curve, but it's concave relative to the first curve. So that first curve was concave that way. And this next curve is very shallow, but it's definitely concave the other, it's, it's convex the other way. So it's going from first curve is like this, that's convex mm -hmm. this way. And then the next curve is not a straight, almost, but it's a little shallow, but the convexity is going the other way. Does that make sense? So first stroke is one, two, three. And the second stroke is mm -hmm. same one. We don't have to redraw that. Apex is shallow. And then the end point. Yeah. Okay. You're training, and this you're is where the, like the eye placement is. Say, say that again. So, so like where the eye placement is, it's very, this is shallow, not really steep. I feel like it's like a steep. Uh, it's, don't overthink it. It's literally three points. Pac-Man. Just literally look to where those, where you're going to put, look to where you're going to put the points on the page, on the printout. Mm -hmm. And you can even mark them. You can mark, you could do this. You could just mark the end of each stroke on your printout. So here's the end of my stroke, and you can make little dashes that indicate the apex. Mm. But you, it needs to be specific. You, this is not a feeling it thing. It's a feeling it thing on top of I know exactly where my stroke is going kind of thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So yeah, keep going. It looks like you may have hooked that out a tiny bit more horizontally, but it's okay. It's close. This is a start. Now he we're has that over bump on his nose. nose here. Yeah, we're going over the bump of the yeah. nose. Oh, shoot. I accidentally touched it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And then... It's shallow, but still has a... It's it's like sort of, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying for the nose is sort of a shallow hill and then mm -hmm. a inflection where it becomes concave but very, very shallow concavity before it hits the tip. So would you still draw that tiny little inflection? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. That's, that's subtlety, that's mastery, that's calligraphy, that's traditional drawing. Yes, 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 yes. What else are we doing? You know, if you're drawing Mr. Incredible, you can draw it's a box for it. But if you're, what we're trying to learn from them is exactly this kind of beautiful movement, calligraphy, gesture, subtlety, and it's all about where those turns are. Yeah. You don't have to ever draw a curve that fast if you don't want to. It's up to you. 
There's nothing, it's not, it has nothing to do with speed. Because okay. it bumps here and it kind of. Yes, yes. But do you see how you're, you're actually checking the vertical of where it should go? I don't feel like you were doing that so much before. That's what I'm trying to get you to that do. Slow it, down. slow it down so that you can place the points accurately. Okay. And exactly. You're like, how, how you're like, okay, so like the, this is, this is the uh, columella and this is the philtrum and where they join. If I were to draw a vertical line from where they join, well, it's going to cut through the nostril. And then what do you know? It's basically right at the apex. It's, it's right at the apex or very close to the apex of this bump. Do you see that? So draw a vertical line from here on number 10, but so draw a vertical line okay. from here up and you're going to see it's 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 on the apex of this curve so you're looking for these positional relationships between the parts to place those points and then you run the curve through the points then when you get more comfortable with that you can avoid the points and just do the curves but you still need to chain together the curves does that make sense yes yeah it's it's those it's getting those three points more accurate that's what you want to focus on right now but uh this looks good you, you have the right idea a little more follow through too. Okay. I, you're, on, you're on nice paper, <laughs> so I can tell you're being, you really don't want to mess uh, it up. I don't up. care about ruining the paper. I'll spit on it. It's not a big deal. <laughs> it's just but a, a little more fluidity in the movement of the hand when you're actually making okay. the stroke on top of, but the main thing is accuracy of those three points. Was somebody else wanting to uh, jump on stage too? Yeah. Uh, we have two questions right now. Um... Gemma is asking, do we have to end at the last point or do we have to cover and go over it? The last of three of the points. So are you asking, um, is the question, can you work your way down and work your way up and then connect it coming this way rather than just flowing in one direction? Is that the question? I think they, uh, she says no. Is it like not overshooting kind of a question, I believe? And okay. at the last point, let me, uh, uh, I'll, let, I'll let Gemma explain a bit more. Okay. I'll, I'll wait because she's typing. We have another question, though, in okay. the meantime, from Movida. Yeah. The, the, lines, the lines do overlap, right? If you're, talk, if you're asking about how you overlap these strokes, the illusion, look, the illusion is we want it to look like one long, just like calligraphy. We want you to think that we drew the S like this. We want you to think we drew it like Zorro. Oh, actually, Zorro's doing it in three strokes. We want you to think we did this cool S curve. But we didn't. We didn't. Well, what did we do? We did this, and then we did that, and then we did that, and then we did that, and that's how we're doing it. So we're trying to create the illusion of a continuous line unless there's an overlap. So unless there's an overlap, we're trying to create the – so it's basically hill and valley, hill and valley. That's what, But we're trying to make it look like it was done with one long curve. It's an illusion. Drawing's an illusion. That's the, that's the foundation. And so when you do one stroke and then the next stroke, the stroke tapers off. Every stroke should start thin, get thick, and then end thin when we're doing a, a contour like this. So we start thin, gets thicker, gets thin again. And then those thin parts, like let's say, so let's say my hand is the stroke, zoomed in totally, right? So it's thinner up here, it's thicker here. We have to overlap these until it looks like one line. You see? Oh, what do you know? It's one line, right? Watch my animation. Maybe somebody could link that if somebody has it. My, I have an Instagram animation where I illustrated perfect, perfect from the context of the perfect drawing manual from Karachi, which was the manual after this, showing you exactly how those chain together. You can watch it a hundred times or you can follow along. Uh, that will help you. So if somebody has the link for that, uh, paste that. In case you didn't catch that part of the class. We did cover this in the first few weeks, but maybe, uh, maybe, uh, let me know if that answers the question. So Nick, what's up, dude? Okay. Oh, we have a digital one. If I see correctly. Oh, uh, your stream is not. The stream is not loading for me, Nick. I see it. Uh, can you? Maybe it's. Uh, I believe it's a connection issue. Maybe try reconnecting, Nick. 
gosh, it's annoying. Like every streaming technology we use has got some kind of tech quirk. There will always be issues with connections. Unfortunately, we cannot avoid that. You know what was happening with Patrick Jones, I think? Because he was thinking, why is the connection so slow for me to another person in Australia, in Sydney? It's because it's got to connect to the Genio servers, which might be in Texas, and then it's got to go yeah. back to Australia. So just because you're close together, unless you're doing a direct connection, it's got to go all the way around the world. That's going to be your slowest option. So if you're in Sydney and the server's in Texas and there's another person in Sydney, that's the slowest. Yeah. Ever. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, Gemma uh, got back to us. She oh, says, yes, cool. the question was just how to create the illusion of just one stroke. And you answer, the final part is thinner and so the first part of the new stroke. So I stop at the last point and yes, began yes, from yes, that, yes. paying attention to create the illusion. Yeah. You have to overshoot it, but you don't have to overshoot it with the point. So you could just do one little, if you're drawing points, you could just draw one little point and yeah, you're going to overshoot it a little bit with that curve. And even if you come with the other curve the other direction, it doesn't matter. You're going to overshoot it both times because you want it, you just want it to look like one continuous curve, although it's actually separate, several, several curves. That's like the first, that's like the first illusion we learn. The first illusion we learn is how to chain together these strokes to make it seem like the, uh, the apparent contour of a curving surface. So the first illusion we learn, if we're starting with Fialetti, like in the Renaissance, would be to create a long complex curve and people don't get that and it's it's so interesting so if you watch anybody do a demo from an old master like master study they'll break the curves into straight lines like academically which is not how they worked or they'll try to like feather it which is not how they worked or they'll try to like do it with these big swoops that are just really inaccurate you have to break it down into this language i'm talking about otherwise you cannot get the effect it's not possible. You can only imitate it. And so, and if you can't get it right, you also can't learn from it. So you really need to break it down into strokes. That's step one for the children of the Renaissance. First thing they learn. And that's the only way to get these beautiful, complex, curving things. You can't sketch it. It won't work. With, it, with you know, with, with the contemporary uh, tool set. Uh, somebody's yeah, raising Oh, go ahead. Uh, one second. We're we're gonna get to the person. Just we have one more question waiting. Yep. Is line weight also being introduced in these plates? I felt that in the vanishing three quarter, the cheekbone is lighter. No. Uh, so Fialetti intentionally didn't focus on line weight in these. There is a little bit because he just can't help himself. It's really hard to like not give a little bit of weight if you train it. But this is more beginner friendly than that. So there's no line weight in the Fialetti. Uh, Whereas the Karachi manual, which they put out right after Fialetti, like two years afterwards. And so Fialetti, his title is something like the, it doesn't say how to draw for beginners because there weren't publishing companies and marketing people and YouTubers yet. So the, the title was very weird. It's like the parts of the body and this and this and this and this and this. Well, the Karachi manual that came out after that says the perfect version, and then it gives like a very similar name. So perfect outlines was a thing. Rubens talks about perfect outlines. Leonardo talks about perfect outlines. Today, we would never say such a thing because it's blasphemy from our contemporary uh, uh, perspective. But there was a such thing as a perfectly getting the line work right. And it wasn't about expressiveness necessarily. It was about just how the lines are chained together and whether or not they're done properly. So in the Karachi manual, which is where my demo I'm talking about, Wiggly, do you know what I'm talking about? Could, could you pop that in the chat if they don't? Or do you not know? um yeah i can pull it. it's on my instagram it's, it's it's the animation of the eye i've shared it a few times but uh i shared it at the beginning of the course but since a lot of people here haven't seen it or if anybody yeah heard, I'll, I'll i'll find it i think i have i think uh marion in my private chat with marion I, I sent it to her give me a second i'll grab it oh no that's on my instagram uh, I'm on your Instagram right now. I'm looking for it. Just scroll down until you see like a big Karachi on there. Um, I have, yeah, I don't think it's too far down. But uh, in the Karachi one, they add line weight, which I think I like with Fialetti because I, I think it's this is so different than how every other how to draw instruction in the world today looks like. 
that I, I want to keep it simple, but we might do after this. We'll see if, if there's interest. These have been really popular, but maybe I'll do the Karachi manual next, and then we can focus on line weight next. The other issue with line weight is that they were using, you know, quill pens, and we're using, some people are using fine liners, some people are using digital, some people, I'm using silver points. Everyone's using different techniques. So in order to get line weight, which is covered by uh, drawing one, the free course here on Discord in section two, it talks, I explain exactly technically how you get line weight, where if you, your tool is going to have a thickest stroke, which is our uh, zero degrees, and it'll have its thinnest stroke, which is 90 degrees to that. And that's your zero degrees. And so you have to figure out where to place your hand. So like in calligraphy, you place it at 45 degrees so that you get, so as the curve happens, the actual shape of the tip making contact with the paper changes and you get a thinness and thickness just based on the curve in your tool. But then some tools are radially symmetrical, like a felt tip pen might not have a chisel or whatever. And so for that, you have to do it all with pressure. Like you push down and then the, the thing bulges or like a brush and you, you lower it. So depending on your tool, you, there's different ways to get the thickness and thinness. There's this rotation, there is this inclination, inclination, and then there's rotation. So if this is the paper. The rotation is gonna, and then inclination, which is this, this, and then on top of that, uh, there's specifics to the different uh, tools. There's also pressure. How hard am I pushing? Because if I push down on a quill pen, the tines open up and more ink is released. So it's inclination, it's rotation, and it's pressure. Those are the elements that create thickness. And then depending on if you're using digital or whatever, it's a little different, but we have to cover thickness like as a group, or I'd have to standardize the tool, and then we could do that. But maybe we'll do that as a maybe we'll do that as a follow-up after the field study stuff. Hey Nick. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm 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 here to learn about Fioletti. Let's uh let's see it. Draw something for us. So I was doing this just as a little you know, just so the main thing I have, the main thing I find interesting is 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 how much the actual order of things happen. Yeah, let's see it. I like think, yeah, that first stroke, I think that first long one should have been more than one. Yeah. I think should you're, yeah, you don't make them so. And even that, dude. Even the even the the inner canthus that you just drew, I would have drawn that as one stroke concave, sort of a horizontal coming out, then a C curve, then another horizontal, then another concave, and then it opens up. So, so you, you would have done how many? You have done like you have done like a show, few. Let me show you what I mean. Hold on. Look at this. Let's look. So what I'm saying is, you don't want to do one big this. stroke. No. no. You want to do this? I'll exaggerate it. This, this, okay. This, 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 this. You got to break them into all these different. I know that that that's not the right shape, but you have to break them into individual strokes. That's the I'm, that's yeah, okay. that's the number, that's the number one lesson. Where yeah, it's that, not that, even that. about like, oh, I draw the upper the the bottom. Of the upper lid and then i draw the top lid it matters more just like the lines yeah the, the, the order the order matters in 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 the sense that there's a physicality to the flow and so and also i can sort of just from doing the just from doing it multiple times you know what i mean you start to learn like okay i'm gonna come up and then i'm gonna go over here and then i'm gonna do it again and so you can remember the recipe one two three four so it can help you memorize these patterns but it also can get you into sort of a physical kind of a flow coming up here. I'm coming up here. We're going over. It's a roller coaster. Ah, how we're falling. We're falling. And then it's oops. And then it's flat for a while. Oh my God, that was crazy. And then it's cranking up again. So it can give you sort of a, a, a dance pattern that you can move, but no, it doesn't actually, it's not required. You could go like this and then connect it like that, or you could go like this and go over, but you do want to draw the primary. more about understanding pattern. the curves as they are than the, yes. the vague yeah. orderly process okay yes yes yeah uh so much of sketching and contemporary teaching is vague try to get this try to think of this try to do it. no it's not it's literally the curves right or wrong and it's because this is how i used to do them this is how i used to do them and i'm like well i guess i abandoned yes. that or i'm doing it wrong but like no don't, it's like, don't, don't abandon just because just because steve houston says many lines many times it doesn't invalidate anything about traditional drawing 
he, they're talking about a sketching, an attitude to have while sketching in a certain way, but that's not the same as final line work, final design work. That's not everything, right? So there isn't, so when people like, will take dynamic sketching and they'll be like, oh, I have to do it in ellipse. I gotta do it like this. That's the only way I have to use a fine liner. I have to do my lines like that. That's incorrect, right? That's just one application. That's just one tool in your toolbox. There's many tools in the toolbox, but this is traditional drawing. Everything, all that other stuff is built off of this. This is where that stuff emerges from and comes from. So if you're gonna do this class or do these plates, you have to break down the individual strokes. You have to get those strokes accurate. Start with the primary design lines. The hatching follows the leading edges and supports it. And just keep practicing the, the movements. The Let's do one more. It's like yeah, do one more. yeah, yeah. I mean, but also it's not abstract. There's a perfect, there's a perfect position for these points if you're trying yeah, to make a perfect position. Yeah. I'll do. Let's just do another eye. I've been on eyes. I like the eyes. The eyes are fun. Yeah, the eyes are also uh, the beginning for a reason. They yeah, introduce steps yeah. really beautifully. So I'm doing a. I'll do a profile. Do a profile looking up. Yeah, I see. Okay, now I see what you're talking. Don't draw that first curve as an S curve. Is that an S curve? I guess it is. Yeah. No, no, no it's not. It's not. You, you're fine. I was just warning you. Oh, you're just warning me. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. Okay. I'm then sorry. now, now that's that's convex to the bottom. The next one's gonna be convex to the top, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then come back and up. That could be done as. I've been doing that as three curves sometimes, and then sometimes as one curve. You really need to do it as three strokes. I'm sorry, three strokes to, to make it work. Because it's not quite a C curve. It's actually got a little flattening, right? And then it comes out. It's almost got like a bevel. So that's three strokes. So yeah, so one stroke, and then we're going back, and then another stroke. So one stroke. Yep. And we're going just, it's flatter, and we're going back. And then another stroke to turn the corner. And then you're gonna do one long, then you're gonna do a longer stroke that comes down, but make sure you're getting close enough to the lid there. Cause you see how it gets narrower? Is, is yeah, it gets thing? narrower. I'm sorry, I'm just yes. trying to get the, the, the idea down more than yeah. the look. Yeah, so you're basically, like this is kind of where we were in week one. I don't think you were in this class, but this is where we were on week one. So just stay here and keep practicing these motions and then all this other stuff will be possible. But you have to start drawing it in the correct method first, which it sounds like you understand now. Um, they are kind of hairy. You need more follow through. You need more confidence. That just keep practicing. I'm not great in digital. Okay. Keep going. Cool. I mean, Thanks this is sure. good. It's good practice for digital, though. I mean, it's practice for anything. Doesn't yeah, it makes no difference. It's a way of moving your hand and making marks. That's all. It, that's at this point. That that's the fundamental thing that we're talking about here. It's how to actually make these strokes, right? Here, hold on. Yeah. I'll do it. I'll do it quick, but I want you to notice that it's a what what the foundation of it is, right? So uh, we can go this way, then up, and then do it again, and then do it again, and then I'll do a hook. Oh wait, can you see this? I'll come. I can see it. Back. And I'll do mm -hmm. another hook. I should have connected. And then I'll come down, but I want to make sure I'm ending like here. So I'll come down. And then I'll wrap the other way. Okay. You see? And then this can be extended. Because I was just right. brute forcing the pattern for the most part. Yes. yes. And you get really, you get, can get pretty good, but like it's really is you got to get the points down. You have to, you have to know what the fundamental elements of drawing are, which is That's line. The design. It's line. And how do you make line by chaining together strokes? There's nothing more fundamental than that. Nothing more fundamental than that. That's like the basics of calligraphy. It's the same thing, right? That's that's where we. This is where we probably should start. Right? Yeah, really. Kind of yeah, yeah. But everyone like has this? the most complicated stuff to say about a line. Oh, you should you shouldn't draw a line direct. You should you should just feel it and try it many times, and then and then search and find it. Well, yeah, that's fine when you're sketching, right? But sketching and drawing are not the same activity. They have different roles. They have so different if you only way to different roles. If you only look at Michelangelo's like roughest sketches to prove your point, you're giving you're you're confusing the issue because the end goal is the beautiful clean line work. That's what you transfer from 
the paper to the canvas with a cartoon. That's what you draw on the side of the stone before you carve it. That's what you uh, draft before you make your clay model. You need to end up getting these clean lines eventually, even if there is a sketching pattern that leads there. And then yeah. because this is a little bit more difficult later, people start doing uh, straight line construction. This comes centuries later, but they start doing straight line construction, like, and then like they just sort of round, yeah they sort of round off these these uh, straights to make their curves. But that's that's a way to copy a curve pretty accurately if you're very careful. But it takes too many steps. It's not direct enough, and it, it'll look stiff. That's why academic drawings always look stiffer than traditional drawings because they're not dealing with curves. They're sneaking up on them. They're avoiding them. So these are both legitimate ways to work, but they're both different than the fundamental chain of lines that you get from traditional uh, art. So I think it's important that we learn this in addition to this stuff, right? Thanks for sharing. Keep working on it, Nick. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, Thank you, guys. Marcia. Thank, Thank you for the help. Okay. Pick me yep. up. Yeah. Bye. Um, Next up, we have Marcha. She has a quick question. Yep. And if you're okay, then we have two students who wants to share their work. I mean, yep. we'll go yep. a little longer today because it's a special group. I don't mind, but if anyone only has an hour and has to take off, we're probably not going to cover new territory here if you're in my class. So you can you can take off or you can stick around. It's up to you guys. Okay. Thank you, Joshua. Yep. Marcha, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Joshua. Um, you were talking about. Uh, how you were thinking about other model books, they call them, um, to do after this. So I was wondering, what about the Orspronkelijke Vermaarde Kunstwerk Tekenboek by Abraham Blumhardt? The I Dutch that one. one. That, one's, that one's like much later. That's like a, more of like a high one. Yeah, so uh, yeah, they're all fantastic. If you really want to get into it the way I was doing it, I tried to do them sequentially. And so that's what actually uh. taught so by doing the manual sequentially, and there's a lot, there's more than you know, but by doing those manuals sequentially, I was able to figure out how the drawing technique changed over these centuries. And so if you're interested in that, I would do them sequentially. If you're just looking to get good design and good stuff, I would do this one, I would do the Karachi one, I would do the uh, DeWitt, and I would do the Blomart mm -hmm. one, and then I would probably would make my way to the Julianne and the Bard ones. So you have the full gamut of drawing techniques as encoded in these manuals and then once we get to 20th century it's pandemonium like it becomes very experimental and all different kinds of that it goes all over the place so at that point there's not really a tradition to track in the same way because it changes uh in fragments and into all these different industries and applications but yeah starting with fialetti you can really start with michelangelo because there's several drawings of him that i show and I, I talk about this in volume one but there's several drawings of michelangelo where he is teaching his pupil just on a scrap piece of paper. So they don't actually have to be in these published manuals because with mm -hmm. the introduction of the printing press, they started publishing them. But these drawing, these model sheets, these model pattern books, you know, you have them in medieval times, obviously. They were uh, these model books, these alphabet books. So they actually, predecessors of Fioletti do go back further and you can look to find those. But it would probably be, if you're, if you're just interested in the way I think it is, how the drawing language sort of evolves uh not evolves as in it's getting better necessarily how it just how it changes over time then i would think about yeah but definitely blow marts fialetti karachi uh, the karachi created the first art school and then um and dewitt i like those ones a lot but there's there's actually there's others as well there's there's english ones there's a bunch of them but those ones are, are those are some of my favorite then julian and barg and if you did those you would know more about drawing them the supposed experts because they don't know where this stuff comes from they just got it from the teacher and you would know where it comes from you're like oh shit this is where they start doing the straight line stuff and here's how it you start to see that so i think it's a huge advantage if you really want to understand the craft of drawing but that's probably i don't recommend that very that's pretty hardcore you could also just uh, try to understand the basics of it and then try to apply that to your work in different ways you can also do that cool thank you so much mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Marcia. Uh, Ruchi, I'm gonna invite you to speak. Hello. Ruchi wants to. I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. If not, I'm sorry for butchering it. I wonder if someday the only time the word butchering is going to be used is because of that application. <laughs> used to eat meat. <laughs> uh, 
I think Rooch is AFK at the moment. Um, Zach, are you here? I had two people. Oh, yeah, Zach is here. Okay. Uh, invite to speak. There we go. Hello. Ruchi, take your time. You'll you'll be after Zach. No worries. Hi, Zach. How's it going? Hello. Uh, let me click on your screen. Can I click the thing? Hey. Hello. So I'm doing um, step three of Feel Eddie Plate, uh, the profile, nose profile. Uh, oh, you mean on, on the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're upside down is the only thing, but I can see. Oh, yeah, yeah. My setup's okay. kind of jank. <laughs> Why don't you show me uh, on the clean sheet of paper and draw it big? And okay. don't worry about it being perfect. We're just trying to see if you understand the concept. OK. Let's see it. So it's your first C curve. Yeah, that concavity. Oh, you're already going down the nose? Yeah. OK, so you, you simplified like six curves into one curve. The, look carefully at the forehead. That's not one curve, okay. right? You see how it's kind no. of like a washed out W kind of a shape? That first yeah. curve. If you're starting from the top, that's one C curve, and then the, so it's a mountain or a hill, and then there's a valley, so that's two strokes. Then there's another hill, that's three strokes. And then there's sort of like a more vertical, very shallow line that just drops down, that's a fourth stroke. And then there's this concavity that hooks us around this point right here. This is called the uh, nasion point. So there's another stroke there. So you're using way too few strokes. This is not about okay. summarizing. This is not about, mm -hmm. this is an animation drawing. This is Traditional drawings, different. So you can't okay. simplify multiple Fialetti strokes in one stroke. That, that's, that's the big X, you lost the game. Use the okay. proper amount of strokes. Break it down, let's try it again. Well, since you, yeah, since you haven't been in it, you might not know where to break the strokes, I'm realizing, too. So I got like three right there. So that's like that first. Yeah, the first stroke is very clearly just a simple little C curve, right? The first one's pretty so simple. Just that he's something like that okay and then the, the next one is a it's an inverse of that right so the next one is a is a shallow it, it's a valley but it's not like symmetrical from start to end it sort of is kicking out in a specific way so but the next one is definitely concave the other it's con so the first one's convex this way the second one is concave so it flips and those are two strokes okay it's just one the, the one the next one is more shallow yeah, it has to do with where those points are. That's the only difference, where the three points are. There's no difference in any other way. So by the time you get to the actual like nose itself, you've got one, two, three, four, five strokes before you even actually touch the, the proper, the nose proper. Okay. Let's try it again. Draw big because it's pretty blown out. Yeah, let me uh, do this here. Draw real big, real big. This is conceptual, right? Okay, one stroke. Okay, what, what's happening with the next one? Well, you probably took too that. Far. You, you took it, yeah, you took it too far because now if you try to do the next one, it's kind of overshooting. You got like a line sticking out, but that's the right idea. Yeah. You got the right idea. It's just accuracy. And that might be too yeah, far in. It, it's not accurate, but you're getting the right idea of how to break them down. OK. Do you see how you have to be really thoughtful? Yeah, yeah. I'm going too fast. Yeah, it's going to end up looking like a map of you know Canada or something. But, yeah. a, but at, least it's, at least the curves are, at least you have the right idea. So yeah, so you have the right idea. The apexes and the start and the end points just need to be in the right place. That's the difference. Okay. But you have the gotcha. right logic. But you have to okay. break it down. Don't summarize anything. It has to be broken down into the exact number of 
changes that you can see in the Fialetti, at least. If you wanted to make it more realistic, you, would, you, would, you might even be doing more, more complex than that, if you want to make it more real. So gotcha. this is a minimum, and you definitely can't simplify more than he is. But yeah, you got the right idea. Chain them together okay. like is, that. Yeah. Is there such a okay. thing as having too many strokes? I mean, if... <clears throat> It depends on what you're going for. Because let's say you're doing a work and you want to have just really undulating. If you wanted to, you could, and there's no rule. But the more strokes you have, the harder it is to make it look continuous. And the more strokes you have, the harder it is for you to chain them together. You're more likely to make a mistake or exaggerate a little undulation or a little nuance and make it seem too important. So the amount of complexity that Fialetti is using, it's a pretty good starting point. And you could go more simple if you want to go cartoony or you can go more complex if you need to. But I think Fialetti is showing a pretty good number of curves relative to the size of the actual real world object. How big is a nose? How important is a nose? Well, it's part of a face, that's important. How important is this character versus other characters? And then what is the size of the paper or the canvas or the material? And what is the size of the tool? So there are different factors that might go into it. And also just what stylistically do you like? So there's lots of considerations, but I think stick with Fialetti for now. I think that'll and just okay. if you can draw like Fialetti and get these looking pretty accurate, like some of the students here uh, were doing, Dylan, Pim, uh, Marcia, Elisa, these are typically the people who are good to look at in terms of like their coursework or their work because it tends to be a, a really advanced. There's more, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna name everybody. There's definitely more people who are yeah. getting it. But look at their work and you'll see when it comes together, it's very obvious. It's not. It's not subtle. When you nail it, it'll look like the. It'll look like the Fialetti. Maybe on cleaner paper and a little cleaned up even, but it'll look like these. That's how you know you have it. So you have a very clear target. That's the good thing about imitation and copying the right way and copying the right sources is that imitation is one of the best ways to learn, right? And so when it looks like Fialetti, that's how you know you have it. That's so simple. You don't have to think about boxes and four-dimensional space and all the other stuff that <laughs> students can get overwhelmed by you just focus on just get these lines right for now okay yeah awesome thank, thank you, you Joshua. For for it. thank you. you got anything else thank you zach okay and ruchi are we ready Yes. Okay. I cool. send you an invite for the to join us on stage. Stand for a second. Oh. In moments like this, I wish I had a standing desk. <laughs> so used to like carving lately that if I sit, I start feeling antsy. Ah, oh, yeah. I know what what you mean. Okay, Ruchi, can you hear us? You're muted. Hi, yeah, uh, I can hear you all. Actually, I am not able to join from my phone. Uh, would would that be okay? Uh -huh. Just okay. Show, uh, show it from your show it from my laptop. Uh, you can do it from the laptop or from the phone. Uh, oh, phone actually is ringing. That's why I couldn't join in the first place. Okay. Hello, Ruchi. Hello, hi. Uh, just a minute, I'll just show you. Sure. Thank you for sharing. You're very brave. But we're talking about how scary it is to watch camera. I agree. It can be sometimes really scary to go on stage and then oh, yeah. draw in front of people. Jerry Seinfeld used to have a joke about it. It's like people are more scared of you know, giving the eulogy than being in the coffin. Okay, we're getting a video. We're reading you. We're reading you, Rich. Okay, nice. Can you get those real close to the camera so that it can focus on them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it looks like you're definitely understanding the concepts. So what I want you to work on, Richie, is the over, the try not to, to show the overlaps if it's not an actual overlap. So in, so. In, unless there's an object in front of another object or like part of the object. So like, for okay. example, this form is in front of this so that this line could overlap that. But when we're talking about the profile, this is not really, the only real overlap in the profile is the, uh, 
these cartilages. So besides that, let's treat it as one continuous line. So just be more careful with how these connect and try not to leave a little, a little tail there. But it looks like you're getting it. Those look very fluid and very confident. So just keep working on it. Fantastic. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Or you just want that feedback? You're teaching really well. So I'm getting to uh, get the gist how it's working. So yeah, thank you so much for it. It's kind of simple in a way. Traditional drawing is kind of simple. It's only complicated if you don't understand how it's done. So I think sometimes things can seem very vague and difficult. But if you have an understanding that is conceptually solid, just, you know, it's just, we're just tuning together these strokes right now. So just keep focusing on that. It'll look great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any, any other you, questions Richie. or anything else? Okay, uh, so far we don't have anything. Uh, does anybody want to ask something, Joshua, uh, for Joshua? Or does, does somebody else want to share their work? Let's see. Yeah, I think next week we'll start probably talking about hatching too, in terms of like, where are the lines going, right? Because look, there's very few lines here, very few lines here, and there's a bunch of lines there. How, are, how is the artist deciding where to put the lines? Well, they're using an egg, as we talked about, and then they're deciding on a light direction. And then just like with a sphere, they're literally lighting the head the same way. So if they're deciding that, for example, this is where the core shadow on this egg would go, you can hold a real egg and you can really do this in reality. Once you decide where your core shadow on your egg would go, which in this case is doing something like this, so the light is quite high and it's a frontal light and it's it's, it's frontal, which means it's here. It's not coming from behind the paper. It's coming from here. It's high. And it's also probably something like this. This is where the light's coming from, right? So all you need to know is an egg. Because then the core shadow of an egg would do something like this in that case, which is just a distorted sphere, right? And then once you know where the core shadow should go, it just needs to undulate and wrap around the anatomical forms, or even not even anatomical, these simple forms. So it's, it's, it's on the beard and then it's creeping up here and it's going around the cheekbone and then it's sort of going through the hair and it's passing to the cranium back here and it's wrapping up. But essentially this is just like an ellipse. It's just an ellipse that's been broken up and detailed following the form. This is how you light things from imagination. This is also how you organize and understand lighting from life. It's not about necessarily, it doesn't have to be about copying shadow shapes or copying anything. You can literally just use a simple round egg form like that and then break up that core shadow to follow whatever forms it's crossing you can do i mean i can show you right now here okay so i turned off one light let's say this is this is like my egg it's just a round form right this is a stand in for my head so let's say this is like an egg it's not obviously something make it eggy it's not a perfect egg but the light was coming from here and then we've got sort of like core shadow across here, like in the lips, right? So if I had a real chicken egg, it would look similar to this. Let's, let's, all we need to know to light something from imagination to begin with is just what solid we're using to simplify it. Now let's stick my big stupid head there, right? So it's still doing the same, still doing the same pat, simple pattern, you see? But because my head is not actually an egg, it's more complicated, we just need to change direction on the brow change direction as we hook across, hook across the face, kind of move forward a bit because the face is projecting just like animals. We have prognathism, or we have a muzzle, it comes forward, although some people have, some people's face project more, some people's face are flatter, but it's still, you know, the teeth come forward, right? So it's the same thing. And so just using a simple form like an egg or a cylinder or a box or whatever, that gives you the logic that you need. And then you just, to get your core shadow or your terminator, and then you just, have to go over the landscape like it's a trip to grandma's house in the car. All, all the kids get in the truck, going to grandma's house, beep, beep, oh, oh, going up here, going up here, going up here. Oh, it's sort of flattening out here. And then, oh, wow, this, yeah, you know, over this big bump here. And so you're moving over that surface, like what you learn with cross contour lines and dynamic sketching and running the cross con contour lines and drawing foundations one, drawing the simple forms. Running cross contour lines across your object is practice for figuring out where the terminator of the shadow can go, among other things. And once you know where that is, then you're just hatching um, different directions across that break. And that is what 
allows you to light things from imagination. You use a simple form. So the egg gives you a lot. It doesn't just give you where to put the features and remind you how to make it round. It also gives you a stand-in and a, a program to run in order to light it from any angle. So I can do this. I'm sure some of you can do this as well, but you can, should be able to draw a head from imagination, light it from any angle. And the only way to do that is to know the curves that make it up, to know the surfaces or have a, a good idea of where the surfaces are, have some kind of stand-in that you can light from imagination, and then make it more complicated. That's the secret. That's the key to lighting from imagination the way the old masters did it. And uh, it works beautifully. No one's done it better. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions? So far, no. Did we ever find that Instagram video or no? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did. We posted it a few times. OK, can you, uh, can you put it on video? I want, I want everyone to see it, because not everybody here yep. is in the class, obviously. I want them to all see what I'm talking about. So I'm going to show, we're going to show you a video. This is perfect line work according to the Karachi, who created the first art school. New Masters Academy, the logo is this flower, almost like this flame-like flower, sort of like a fleur-de-lis. That's inspired, that represents the roots or the traditions of the past, the actual, the blossoming plant or Lily, it represents you. The New Masters Academy refers to you. You're the students. You're supposed to be the New Masters. So I hope you guys are taking that seriously because it's your job to take the craft further. So that's what it represents, but the actual Lily motif comes from the Florentine Lily, and Florence is the center of drawing during the Italian Renaissance. It's also where the, this manual came from Italy. Uh, this manual came from Venice, but the Caracci brothers, so Agostino, uh, Ludvigo and Antonio Caracci, fantastic draftsmen and painters, they created the world's first art academy. And so the Florentine lily was a symbol associated with that. So uh, this, this is me recreating one of the Caracci drawings that were meant as a teaching tool, except for now we have line weight. It's a little more advanced, but what you're going to be able to see in this video is you're going to be able to see what perfect line work, work looks like. So according to their, their perspective. So it's, it's essentially a animation that is creating sort of a perfect demo. So maybe Wiggly can, uh, oh, are you playing? Can you make that bigger, the actual screen or no? Can you zoom in on it? Yeah, yeah, zoom like crazy and then maybe start it over the playback. So look at Wiggly's screen, full screen if you guys can. can you, is it possible to reset the playback? Or it probably will just play over again once it's done. I would just make it as big as you can. Yeah, just zoom in as much as you can on it. Okay, so we're going up. We're not doing any of this. So if you really want to understand everything about the line work without taking a class or paying a dime, just analyze this video very carefully. That'll teach you everything you need to know about the line work. We're not doing a full circle for the iris. We're going to build it up with a different series of curves. And then if we want to thicken it more than just the thickness of our pen or, or tool allows, we go over it again slightly offset. You see this? Look at this. Look at the inner campus, Nick. That's what you weren't doing. We're trying to draw it too directly. Do you see how it's created in a series of uh, different strokes that get connected? Look at how now we're going over the top of the lid. Now we're uh, doing the rim of the lower eye. And these lines all support each other. So the shape of the eyelid is modified to create the upper border of that shape. And that's modified to show the inner corner of this area here under the glabella, this inner corner of the eye. This is concave and we're showing the concavity with lines. More pigment means shadow. Shadow implies recess or shade side. In this case, it's implying recess. So this is a recessed area. It's dark. It's more lines there than on the lid here. Because in this case, the light's coming from, if I remember correctly, it's coming from this side, but we'll have to see. Might be more of a frontal lighting. Oh, that's not the entire. We have one. That's actually, yeah. I will, uh, I have to find this. It's on Vimeo somewhere. I have the full version that's not truncated because where the entire eyebrow is done. But this is, the, this is the idea. So watch this video. This will give you an idea of what traditional line work looks like. And once you understand this, understanding art history from this point on and backwards becomes much, much easier because you understand these basic tools. And then if you try to actually do it, if you're not chaining the lines together properly, you won't get the right effect. And 
it'll just be more mysterious and you just won't know. So this is, I spent a lot of time on this animation you're watching. I think I spent like two months on this. So I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> There's no chance I'm going to do this again. But this is for your, this is for your benefit. This is also for the Italy workshop. That's one of the, that's one of the, the reasons I did this because it's what we're going to do. Some of what we're going to be covering there. Oh, and there's a little. That's funny coming up. Yeah, it's like five weeks. Yeah, very soon. One month. A bit more than one month. But, yeah. Yeah, you guys have the link. Be sure to check that out. You also, if you have new masters, yeah. if you have a library plus or the legacy premium subscriptions or higher, you should be able to access the Fialetti plates from the original book that I photographed or Daniel photographed in my book. Uh, if you don't have access to NMA, you can't afford NMA, you can find another version of the Fialetti plates on archive.org. It's obviously pre-copyright, so there's no problem with that. Uh, the, the images are not as high quality. Ours are 100 megapixels. Those look like they're like 20 megapixels. The photos aren't as good, uh, but you can also get it because it's pre-copyright without paying anything. And so it, I recommend if you can't join us uh, and do it with us, that you try working through it on your own. I think the manuals are really a fantastic, a really fantastic learning resource. And it is absolutely bonkers to me why we don't use this to teach today. Because it's not just teaching a style, it's teaching the fundamentals that we're using the offshoots of that now without fully understanding them. So I think it's a really good idea to teach this way. Since I started doing this in Master Monday and then drawing one and then in my classes, other teachers online and in person have started doing that. So I've never seen Fialetti in any art class or heard of it ever, and now people are starting to use it. So I think this is something that is working for people. The students seem to be getting really good results. We keep hearing this, the feedback has been really, really good. So I'd like to keep building on this. And uh, maybe after we do this round of Fialetti stuff, maybe we do one of the other manuals. Maybe we go to the Karachi manual. So, um, but anyway, uh, yeah. Thanks everybody for joining. Is there anything else? I think we got 10 minutes left. Yeah, we have, we have one more question pertaining the, uh, the, the eye video. Uh, Movita is asking in the Instagram video, do the grids in the background serve as a guide for the drawing? Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, yeah, so there is a certain proportional relationship between the different parts of the eye. And um, so I'm using the grid in order to get the lines in the correct place. But understanding underlying patterns that support the features, that is going to depend on what style of character you're trying to make, right? So if you're doing a manga or something, those proportions are not going to be the same if you're doing. So that's sort of, that's uh, really important, which is, how the, the underlying uh, construction and proportions of, of these patterns is very important. But the focus of this class and of Fialetti's manual, because Fialetti's not showing you those constructions except for the egg and a few things. The idea of this level of instruction is just to get you familiar with the line tools and the shading and thinking of the egg and wrapping ellipses. So this is a little bit more basic than what is the actual construction pattern of the entire body, which is something that I, I spend a lot of time on that. That's, that's an area of specific focus for me, but I see that as a little bit more advanced than this. But yeah, you basically, in the ancients, we're doing that too. If you look at my Instagram, you look at, uh, there's a post I made, I think it's like three posts down of a nose on a grid. And so figuring out what those grids were and how artists from ancient Egypt all the way to you know 18th century or 19th century work trying to find what patterns of construction they use is also a super fascinating task. This is just a little bit more like, how do we draw? How do we make lines? How do we draw a head? How do we construct it at a basic level? But yeah, you can go quite deep on this stuff and you can design your own systems. You don't have to use a system of, you, don't have, you can design your own proportion systems, you can design your own stuff, but knowing what the tools are and learning a system to begin with, that allows you then to, uh, to, to have the knowledge of the method and then you can change the content. So I find this stuff to be really powerful, regardless of what style of art. I mean, obviously, if you're doing something that's super abstracted, you know what I mean? Like if you're doing noses like this and you're just trying to push that stuff, then this stuff maybe is a little too precise. But even then, I think you can benefit because the, the more thoughtfulness goes into the proportions and the placements of your work and the more you have these really clear lines that define the form, I think the stronger it's going to look just generally. So I think everybody can sort of benefit from that. But obviously, depending on what you want to do with some people more than others. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Uh, we do not have any questions left. 
so okay. I think we can say goodbye for thank today. You <laughs> thank you for joining. And yeah, I'm excited. I'm going to be watching all the, re the other events today. So I'm just going to go get some popcorn after this. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Joshua, for today's session. And to everybody who did not make the first orientation for the four-year program, we're having that one now again with Marianne over at the Demio. You can find the link under the program updates channel uh, under the four-year tab. So everybody welcome to that one. If uh, not, then we have in one hour the figure drawing. So Is everybody welcome to that one. That one. Is that yeah. Maybe on stage Sorry. Or just um, the figure one, I believe it's gonna be on uh, Discord. Okay. Not on Demio. Awesome. Um, I will correct myself if I am wrong, uh, but I I believe it is on Discord. <laughs> All right, everybody. See see you soon. Thank you again.